This is the 20th anniversary of Helen and Gary Snelzer celebrating their life with Christ here at Christ Church. 20 years ago, they made their way into this church, and they have been nothing but a gift to the Lord and to us during that entire time. Uh, Gary has had a distinguished uh, career in the Air Force, 30 years uh, serving, uh, starting off, uh, his dream was be a, to be a pilot, so he was a pilot and he actually directed aircraft in Vietnam. Uh, he has mapped all sorts of places uh, from, uh, from a C-130 and done uh, so many other things. He started an aircraft and he sort of ended up in a spacecraft because uh, Gary, Major General uh, Schnelzer, is best, best known for his work even today working uh, with uh, the Pentagon uh, and with NATO uh, in matters of space uh, warfare and so forth, things that are probably so classified I couldn't even, you know, look at the envelope. Uh, but uh, it gives me a great deal of, um, gives me a great deal of, uh, of confidence that men and women uh, have the it, of the stature of Major General Snelzer are looking out for the future of our country uh, even today. I'm so pleased that two of our other generals are here with us. Uh, Major General Lee Rogers is with us, uh, who works so hard in outreach here, and Lieutenant Gen and, Lou and, and our, our own uh, senior warden. Uh, is uh, with us, who I call, of course, the General Malays or the General Nuisance, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant General Daryl Jones. Uh, I'm glad you're here. I didn't want to have to call you two down later. When General Snelzer uh, left the Air Force, he came to San Antonio, and he uh, was asked by the bishop, then Bishop Foltz, to serve as canon to the ordinary, which is the second ranking position in the diocesan office underneath the bishop. And there he directed all the, the financial affairs and uh, the legal affairs of, of the diocese. But he also got heavily involved in world mission. He was there when we began our real push on world mission. And his and Helen's heart mainly became wedded to Uganda. And what a great gift tonight to have uh, have. Sunday Dugira here from Uganda. She heads the Women's Center in Nebi. Uh, that was Helen's special desire, to have a ministry that upheld the ministry and the life of women. And it is a dream come true. The dream that's not to come true for Sunday is that she came here for a short visit and she's been stuck in the United States because of the coronavirus. So, you know, pray for Sunday to one day be able to go back home. Uh, so... Uh, with that, I ask uh, this small congregation to get a little rowdy and let us welcome the distinguished Major General Gary Schnauzer. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, Sonny was supposed to have gone home at the end of, end of March. In fact, Helen's going to go with her. So the, well, had it happened later, she'd be in Uganda and we'd be sitting here by ourselves looking at her on Zoom, I guess. But thank you, Sunday, thank you for being here. Thank you for the privilege of speaking. Appreciate being here. And what an amazing entree, amazing grace. You know, for the topic tonight, there could not be a better, better topic at all. In fact, John Newton's, you know, first stanza, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found but blind, but now I see. Perfect, right? How appropriate are these words for the topic tonight? It, de it deals with racial relations. A topic I'm sure that, well, we've heard a lot about recently and we're gonna hear about it one more time. John Newton, the 18th century priest, as you probably know, know the story, he was a slave trader. He did that for his first, you know, 20, 30 years of lifetime and had a revelation. A revelation that he should leave the trade and go into the church, which he did. So at age 39, 
He becomes an Anglican priest outside London. But it wasn't a complete transformation per se in terms of you know, dealing with the, the sins of the past and being a slave trader. That really didn't come until much later when he was actually about 55. When in London, in, it was 1780, he joined up with William Wilberforce, who became the great crusader in the British Parliament for the abolition of slavery. The Slave Trade Act was passed in 1807. It abolished slavery throughout the British Empire, including Uganda, and the slave trades to the east and to the west. That's the year that John Newton died. Same year he died, they passed that act. What does that have to do with today? A lot. It really does. You know, we're all impacted, I'm sure you are too, by the morning newspaper, the evening newscast, and, of course, George Floyd's death. You know, we all die, but the act of that death was horrible, and that doesn't say enough. We've all seen that. But I would also submit that if that had been a lone case, it would not have been on the news every night for the great demonstrations taking place across the United States. No. It was preceded by a young man in the wrong neighborhood in South Georgia being run down by pickup and shot in many, many incidences like that before. Systemic. Systemic. Yes, it impacts us, it impacted me. You know, Floyd was born in 1973. Our son was born in 1970. Our daughter in 1975. As a parent, as we parents, I cannot imagine anything more horrible than the death of a child, especially via that means. It brings it home. It makes it personal, does it not? Well, what do we do about it? But we're doing a lot. If you looked at the uh, news hour last night on PBS, you would have seen our chief of staff of the Air Force, Goldfein, and our chief master sergeant of the Air Force, Wright, talking about this issue in the Air Force. Chief Wright was very blunt and forthright. And he talked about his time before and now as a black man living in Washington, D.C. He talked bluntly about the fact when he sees the blue lights behind him flash, there's a gut feel in his belly that this could be bad. A gut feeling that I don't have and most of us don't have, right? It was a Amazing to see the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force talk in a very blunt language. Maybe it's overdue. Likewise, the same day yesterday, the Senate approved the nomination of Charles Brown as the new Chief of Staff of the Air Force. In fact, he's the first black to be the Chief of Staff of any armed forces. It was approved 98 to 0. It's a statement. It's a statement. A statement of progress. Of progress, maybe. But it's at the grassroots, it really counts, does it not? You know, you think about this, it's like John Newton. It's experience, reflection, and faith. Don't you have to combine all three? And I thought about that. I listened to Patrick's sermon on Sunday on the TV. And Patrick, it was impacting. Like I told you, I sent you an email. How it just it was a trumpet call. It really was. 
It caused me to think, reflect, and pray. And thank you for the invitation tonight. Let me tell, tell you my story a little bit. Born in Ohio, but grew up in the South, grade school. Went to grade school in Florida, in Virginia, okay? Segregated schools. I never saw black people. So we're not there, just not there, right? Everything was white. Went to high school, went back to Ohio, and went to high school there, and integrated school, and blacks and whites in the classroom. But come recess, or come the end of the day, we all went back to our neighborhood, white or black. College. Went to Ohio, Bowling Green State University. Same thing. Uh, we had integrated state university, a uh, fair number of groups, uh, you know, blacks and others. But at the end of the day, I went back to my white Protestant fraternity. The blacks went back to Alpha Phi Alpha, and the Jews went back to their fraternity next door to ours. There's no social engagement at all. None. But changed. Went on active duty. Went to pilot training, Del Rio. So I had a taste of great Mexican food and what that culture is all about. But it was after pilot training, my first assignment, I went to uh, Turner Air Force Base, Georgia, on a crew of a photo mapping. C-130. We had seven crew members, two African Americans. First deployment, Brazil. Lieutenant's dream, right? Went from city to city, we'd go to a city, get a, go to a hotel, have dinner. We basically lived as a family for three months. Seven crew members. Next we went to East Africa, Ethiopia, same line. But when we came back to Albany, Georgia, we couldn't go out to the restaurant. We couldn't socialize unless we did that on base. Could not do it. What's 1966? Well, you know what was going on in 1966 if you're gray hair. <laughs> Albany, Georgia, Martin Luther King, the his organization came south to Albany. The only church that stood up and made a stand was the local Episcopal church. Only one. Of being young, lieutenant, and being, wanting to be involved, I said, I'm going to go to the Episcopal church, and I went to confirmation. Not to be confirmed, which I was, but to listen. To listen why they had the courage to stand up for the principle of desegregation. It was interesting to hear. Well, it was only a year there, and I left. I went to Southeast Asia, became a FAC, Fort Air Controller. And in combat, those who've been in combat, the term Band of brothers is true. Band of brothers. When bullets fly, the guy next to you is your brother. Brother really is. No doubt about it. So I came back, came back to McDill Air Force Base, Tampa, Florida, all right? Uh, classified reconnaissance squadron. And the same time I arrived, a general by the name of Benjamin Davis arrived. General Davis, the lieutenant general, was the most senior African American in the military. Most senior. Tampa, 1966. <laughs> you know what the newspaper said? The audacity to assign him here. Right? Audacity. 
Well, that got my attention. I still remembered Albany, Georgia. So I did some research on General Davis. General Davis was a West Point graduate, graduated in 1938, had spent four years at the Point in a silence treatment. No cadet would talk to him unless required to. Can you imagine that? Four years. Not a word was spoken unless it was commanded to be so. He had the gumption, the will to go through that. I can't imagine many people would. He graduated in 38. There were not too many assignments for a line officer. There were only two at the time. <laughs> Tuskegee Institute, Alabama, military science. You know, there's a fate portion of this right here, fate, because Tus Tuskegee became the center of the African American Air Force. That's where they trained. Red Tails, Red Tails, I'll tell you about that in a second. Red Tails were a group that were formed. They flew uh, fighters okay, at the time. And General Davis became the, eventually the commanding officer later in that when they were in Europe. Not at first, they only had white officers, right? Only whites. Some of the folks have been trained in Seymour, Indiana. Not Seymour, North Carolina, but Seymour, Indiana, where some of the guys trained in the local town laundry would not do their laundry, but would do the laundry of German POWs. Okay? Takes gumption to stay the course. Well, anyway, they deployed overseas. About 355 pilots uh, and actually pilots. They had crew members too, but pilots. And they probably had the best record of any fighter unit for protecting bombers. If you saw the movie, it's true. They had they stayed with the bombers and protected them. And in fact, they were best friends of the bomber crews, Eighth Air Force, Eighth. Uh, of the 355 men that went over, 84 did not come home. You can do the percentages. Okay. That's the Red Tails. That's General Davis, a man of immense integrity. Well, the next assignment was, of all places, Honolulu, Hawaii, to go to the University of Hawaii. Can you imagine that? Miami to Hawaii. And there I got my next lesson in relationships with other cultures. We became involved, Scott, with a Japanese American group there. In fact, Helen took flower lessons at the time. We became our group in our church. I learned about the 100th Battalion. The 100th Battalion was made up of Japanese Americans they were not allowed to enlist immediately after Pearl Harbor, but they were eventually allowed to form a group, which they petitioned to do, by the way, to form a combat group, 100th Battalion. Out of the 100th, 100th Battalion came the 444th, 442nd Infantry Regiment. And that was composed of people that were volunteering, or drafted even, out of the internment camps in the mainland that housed Japanese Americans. They formed the 442nd. Regiment. It was sent to Italy. It probably attained more awards and medals than any American unit of its size in World War II. They had 21 people that received the Medal of Honor. 21 in a regiment. Can't imagine that. And they're also famous because there was a Texas National Guard unit trapped behind German lines. And the 442nd was asked by the commanding general to rescue the Texans, which they did. They lost 800 men and rescued 211 Texans. Governor Connolly, in 2010, made that whole regiment honorary Texans. I could talk a lot more. I'd love to talk about Colin Powell, and how he saved the lieutenant colonel. I did that for the coffee hour. But I will tell you about his retirement, though. Colin Powell, the most senior African American in our military history, retired in 
93, the Clinton administration had just taken over, and he had served under Bush. And at the retirement ceremony at Fort Myer, the Clintons were sitting on a platform with the Joint Chiefs of Staff behind them, and on the ground in folding chairs with the Bushes. Well, General Powell, with the presence of mind, goes up to the stage, and Admiral Jeremiah was the vice chairman at the time. He whispers to Vice Chair, uh, Admiral Jeremiah, and all of a sudden the chiefs get up, leave the stage, and Powell brings the bushes and sets them next to the Clintons. What a presence of mind. He was even a better combat leader. Well, that's my reflection. And what next? Well, like John Newton, it's experience, isn't it? I've got 77 years of it. But it's a reflection upon that experience that you combine with the faith that makes it whole and makes sense out of it all, right? And the sense I make out of, out of it is we are all the children of our God. And for the children of God, that makes us brothers and sisters. And if brothers and sisters can work together, we can solve this problem that we've got right now in this wonderful country. Thank you.